Uh, welcome to the online classroom uh, for the module FIN 3701. Uh, in this class, I'm going to be taking you through part two uh, uh, discussion and explanation on assignment one for the year 2021. Uh, we've already looked at uh, question one in a lot of detail. It was a long class and hopefully in this class I'll be able to cover question two, three and four, just explaining uh, the calculations and the approaches. So we can start, we'll start with question two. <clears throat> question two says Copcon uh, PTY Limited wishes to expand and modernize its facilities. Uh, the installed cost of a proposed computer controlled automatic feeder will be 130,000 Rand. Uh, the new roaster right, will be depreciated over a five year straight line period. So, this roaster that will be purchased for 130,000 will be depreciated over a five year straight line period. Uh, in order to finance this new roaster, the company has a chance to sell its four-year-old roaster for 35,000 Rand. And that existing roaster had an initial installed cost of 60,000 Rand and was being depreciated over a six-year straight line period. Right. And sales revenue from the expansion will amount to 70,000 Rand per year and operating and other expenses, including depreciation. Remember in the previous class, I always said, always check to see when they give you operating or fixed expenses, does it include or exclude depreciation? So it's important. Yeah, our operating expenses include depreciation. Uh, operating and other, and other costs, including depreciation will amount to 29% of sales. And then we give another additional information here. The number of issued shares is 10 million. The debt is 200 million. Before tax cost of borrowing 12%, share price 24 Rand. Uh, latest dividend D0, 2.4. Expected growth rate 5% and the tax rate 29%. So remember, we said some tutorial letters have 28% and others have 29%. So both uh, both uh, tax rates will receive credit if you're using um, another tutorial that I actually think when I created these um, assignment solutions, uh, I was actually using uh, a tutorial letter <coughs> uh, that had 20, 28%. So the lecturer said you will receive credit uh for for either either approach okay All right so don't worry too much about that so uh, 2.1 says calculate the weighted average cost of capital uh 2.2 says calculate the net present value internal rate of return and the payback of the roster uh 2.3 uh, state on the basis of the npv and irr whether the company should expand and modernize its facilities. Okay. So uh, the first thing we need to do, uh, we need to calculate our weighted average cost of capital. Uh, we simply calculate the after tax cost of debt, which is just the cost of debt before tax, which is 12% multiplied by one minus the tax rate. See, this is the tax rate I'm talking about. Other tutorial letters are 28% and this 29%. You can either you can use either of those, and then we get an after-tax cost of debt of eight point six four percent. If we use twenty eight percent, so we just take the before-tax cost of debt, then we multiply by one minus the tax rate. Then the cost of equity with the cost of equity, uh, we just take D zero. Uh, times one plus the growth rate over the price plus the growth rate because we were given the the latest dividend. The latest dividend is D zero. Okay. If we were given the expected dividend, there would be no need to multiply by one plus the growth rate. Then we get fifteen point five percent. 
So we just have two sources of finance. We don't have preference here dividends. So we can calculate our work uh, by simply taking um, the weight of debt times the cost of debt after tax plus the weight of equity times the cost of equity. Uh, we don't have to adjust the cost of equity for tax. We just adjust the cost of debt. And then to determine your weights, remember, when we are calculating work, um, we should always start uh, by checking to see if we've been given a target capital structure. If we've been given a target capital structure, the weights of the target capital structure are what we use for our work. However, if we have not been given a target capital structure, we have to use uh, the market values to determine the work. So always check first to see if you've been given the target capital structure. For example, we might have told the target capital structure is 30% debt and 20% equity. Then those are the weights we would use. But if we have not been given the target capital structure, then we have to use market values. So for the purposes of this question, we haven't been given the target capital structures. So we have to use <coughs> Uh, the market values. The, the market value for debt, uh, we'll assume that's 200 million, it's given right there. And then we can get the market value of the ordinary shares by taking the number of the ordinary shares multiplied by the price per share, okay? So if we, if we use that, um, this is the market value of debt. Uh, the number of ordinary shares times the market price per share. This is the market value of equity. If we add those two, we get the total market value of the company. And then for our weights, we simply take the market value of debt divided by the total market value. And then we take uh, the market value of equity, which is simply 10 million times 24, divided by the total market value of the company. And then we get our weights the weight for debt and the weight for equity. This is the weight for debt, this is the weight for equity. And you can just double check to see if you did the right calculations by adding these two, 0 0.4545 plus 0 0.5455. If the total is equals to one, it means you did your calculations correctly, okay? And then after that, we can then substitute our weights and our costs into the work formula and then we get a weighted average cost of capital of 12.38%. Okay. Uh, the next part of the question asks us to determine the net present value and the internal rate of return and the payback of the roster. Now, uh, for this part of the question, uh, we have to calculate the installed cost of the new assets. I'm sure you're now comfortable with this. Uh, in the first part of the class, I went through it in detail. We just take the installed cost of the new asset, which is um, 130,000 rent. Then you should always check to see if they are delivery or installation expenses. Uh, they are not there, it's just uh, 300,000. <clears> then we take the after tax proceeds from the sale of the existing asset. Uh, remember, we said that the after tax proceeds, we simply take the market value minus the tax expense, the market value of the existing asset minus the tax expense. Um, we were not given tax, so we had to calculate the tax expense. And to get the tax expense, we simply take the market value minus the book value times the tax rate. If the answer is positive, it means we subtract it like I did, but if the tax was negative here, we would add it. Okay, and then we were also not given the book value of the asset. So the, this calculation that I actually put here, when I'm doing this calculation for the, for the installed cost of the new, for the uh, initial investment, you're actually starting with the book value. Then you take the book value and you put it here to help you to get the tax. Then you take the tax and you put it here to help you to get the after tax proceeds from the sale of the existing asset. So even though <clears throat> the calculations are written going down like this, 
when you're actually doing this calculation for the after tax process of the existing asset, you, you start by writing this formula market value minus tax expense. And then usually this will not be given. And then you have to calculate it. And then to calculate your tax, you need to take your market value of the existing asset minus book value of the existing assets times tax rate, right? And then sometimes the book value is not given. So you then have to calculate the book value. Remember what I said before, I said that if the existing asset, uh, if the existing asset has um, a useful life, uh, if the, the existing asset has a useful life that's equal to its age, then the book value will be zero. But in this case, the, the useful life of the asset is not equal to the age of the asset. So it means our book value is not zero. So we need to take the installed cost. We take the installed cost of our exist to get the, the, the book value. We take the installed cost of the existing asset minus the accumulated depreciation. And then if we're using the straight line method to get the accumulated depreciation, we simply take the installed cost divided by the useful life years multiplied by the age, right? So we end up with 60,000 and then <clears throat> uh, this divided by this, I think it should be uh, one, uh, oh, it's, sorry, it's actually divided by six, right? It's divided by six because uh, that's the, the useful years. So 60,000 divided by six is 10,000 times four, which gives us 60,000 minus 40,000, giving us uh, 20,000, right? So this will be the, the book value, okay? So that's how we, we get that, that book value that I am showing you right here. That's how we got the, the book value. Okay, and then we put the book value there, then we got the tax and then we added the tax because it was positive year. It means we made a profit, so we pay a tax expense. So that's how we got the 30,800. 35,000 minus 4,200 gives us 30,800. So that's the after tax process from the sale of the existing asset. And then in this question, we weren't given any information on change in networking capital. So this will just be zero. So minus 130,000 plus 30,800, we get 99,200. And then after that, uh, we have to reproduce the income statement. We just have to reproduce the income statement. We take our sales revenue for each year. Remember, we're told that the new asset is going to have a five-year life. It's going to have a five-year life. So we reproduce the income statement over five years, take our sales revenue minus operating costs. We get our earnings before interest and tax. Uh, remember, our operating, it's actually sales revenue minus operating expenses. We were told that operating expenses will amount to um, 29% of sales. So it's going to be 29% of 70,000 Rand. Uh, we subtract, we get 49,700. Uh, our tax is 28%. We find 28% of these amounts is 13,916. Uh, so we take EBIT um, minus our tax, we get our no part. So you note here, we didn't subtract depreciation. We didn't subtract depreciation because we were told that depreciation is included in the operating expenses. Whereas when we did number one, we subtracted depreciation after removing the fixed cost and the variable cost because we were not told that depreciation is included in the fixed cost. Here we were told that depreciation is included in the fixed cost, which are the operating expenses, we included it. Uh, so we get our no part, but then that depreciation, which was included here, we have to add it back. And uh, the depreciation per year for the new asset 
is simply the installed cost of the new asset, which is 130,000 divided by the useful life of the new asset, which is five years. So we get 26,000 per year. We put that 26,000 here. And then if we add, we get these amounts, okay? 35,784, which is no part plus depreciation, we get 61,784. So in this question, <clears throat> so the reason we were calculating these, someone might say, why were we calculating the initial investment and these operating cash flows? If you just get a question in the exam uh, where you're given a capital budgeting question, involving the purchase of a new asset uh, and then selling an existing asset and so forth. Uh, and then you're asked to calculate the net present value, the IRR and the payback. It means uh, you need to determine cash flows. This is the first step. You need to determine cash flows uh, associated with the capital budgeting exercise. If these cash flows have not been given and then afterwards, these cash flows are the ones you will use in the calculation for the NPV, the IRR, uh, the payback. So in an exam, a lot of students struggle if a question like this comes in the exam, they're just told to calculate the work, then after that to calculate the NPV and the IRR. And nothing is said about the, the cash flows associated with the projects. Compare, compare that with number one. With number one, you were clearly first asked to calculate the initial investment, your terminal cash flow, and then afterwards to get the NPV. So with number one, they guide you on what to do first. But in number two, they don't guide you. You're just told to calculate the work, then the NPV and the IRR. But as a FIN 3701 student, you should know that the moment you are asked to calculate the NPV and the IRR and the payback, it means you first have to determine, you first have to determine your initial investment, your incremental cash flows, and also your terminal cash flow. If the existing asset can be sold at the end of its life, sorry, if the new asset can be sold at the end of its life, so you you need to factor in um, all that information. Okay, you need to factor in. Uh, all that information. So that's why we were calculating the initial investment and the operating cash flow because we use we need those cash flows to calculate the NPV and the IRR. And even the work, we need the work to calculate these. So uh, if you just get a question that says calculate the NPV and IRR and payback, remember you need your cash flows and you need a discount rate. And usually the discount rate is the work, and sometimes you will have to calculate this. Okay. So in this question, we don't have to worry about a terminal cash flow uh, because uh, we haven't been told that the the new uh, automatic feeder can be sold at the end of its life. Okay. We haven't been given the market value of the new roster at the end of its life. So we assume that it won't be sold. Okay. Uh, in the previous question, the, the, the new asset, we were told it can be sold at the end of its life. However, in this question, we haven't been told anything about the automatic roster being sold at the end of its life. And secondly, we don't have any working capital. We don't have any net working capital. So because because we don't have any changes in networking capital <clears throat> and because uh, the new roster uh, is not sold at the end of its life, is not sold at end of its life. So because we don't have any changes in networking capital and because the new roster is not sold at the end of its life, it means there is no uh, terminal cash flow. So don't worry about the terminal cash flow. You won't always have the terminal cash flow. Okay. So um, once we, we calculate the initial investment and the operating cash flows, we are done. Then we can move on to the IRR and the NPV. Here it's just a matter of using your financial calculator. 
making sure you've cleared your calculator and entering in your cash flows. CF0, CF1, CF2 is just the same amount. We use the WAC as our discount rate, rate shift in PV, depending on the calculator you're using. And then we also get our IRR, depending on the calculator you're using. Um, yeah, so that's important. <clears throat> and then for the, for the payback, uh, with regards to the payback, because the cash flows are uniform, because the cash flows are uniform, uh, we can simply take our, uh, our initial investment. We can simply take our initial investment, which is uh, 99200, and we can divide it by the uniform cash inflow, which is 61784, and then we get 1.61 years. So when your cash flows are uniform, the payback is easy to calculate. Unlike uh, in the previous question, in question one, where the cash flows were not uniform, and I explained uh, this long uh, approach to calculating the payback. So in this case, because the cash flows are uniform, you just divide and then you get your payback. And then the last part of the question says, uh, state on the basis on the, of the NPV and IRR, whether the company should expand and modernize its facilities. Okay, remember, uh, we said that if the NPV is positive, uh, we should invest in the project. And if the NPV is negative, we should not invest in the project, right? Uh, so in this case, our NPV is positive. And also uh, we said if the IRR is greater than the discount rate, we should invest in the project. But if the IRR is less than the discount rate, we should not invest. So in this case, the IRR is greater than the discount rate. So we should invest in the project. So both the NPV and the IRR give us the same uh, conclusion, okay. Next, we can look at question three. Question three is a bit shorter. I won't spend too much time here. Uh, question three and four are actually really short. They're just 15 mark questions. Uh, they won't take too much time. Uh, question three says, um, AutoZone, uh, AutoZone Tire Limited. Uh, wants to expand its production capacity by investing 10 million in new plant and machinery uh, for manufacturing a new brand of tires. Uh, we are told that the company currently has 35% debt and 55% equity and 10% preference shares. So this is what I was talking about before. This is the optimal capital structure. So it means when we're doing our calculation for WAC, we're going to use these weights. But if the optimal capital structure is not given, that's when you need to use market values to calculate your WAC. So the company expects to have a net income of 1.8 million and they base their dividend payments on the residual theory, okay? Uh, debt financing uh, may be obtained uh, at an after-tax cost of 15%. Ordinary shares are currently selling for 38 rand a share and may be issued with flotation costs of 15%. Uh, the firm will pay a dividend, so we've been given D1 year, will pay a dividend of 120 per share in the coming financial year and at a growth rate of 5% over the past few years. Uh, this growth rate uh, will be maintained in the future. Uh, the company is contemplating issuing 9% preference shares uh, that are expected to sell for a par value of 72 rand per share. And the cost of issuing and selling these shares is expected to be 5%. And then we're given our tax rate of 29%. Uh, then we're asked to calculate autos on entire limited component costs, meaning we want to calculate the cost of debt, cost of equity, cost of preference shares and then we'll substitute the cost of debt, cost of equity and cost of preference shares into the weighted average cost of capital formula. Okay, so let's get to that. All right, so firstly, uh, the cost of debt after tax has been given. This is fine. Uh, the cost of equity is just D1 over P0 plus G. 
since it's expected dividend, there's no need for us to multiply it by one plus the growth rate. If it was the current dividend or previous year's dividend, D0, we would have to multiply this 1.2 times one plus the growth rate to get D1, and then we would use D1. So we get 8.16%. And then of course, the cost of new ordinary shares uh, you should always calculate, whenever you're calculating the cost of, of ordinary shares uh, and you've been given flotation costs and issuing costs, you should always calculate the cost of existing ordinary shares and the cost of new ordinary shares, okay? You should always calculate the cost of existing ordinary shares and the cost of new ordinary shares. So uh, the cost of new ordinary shares will be um, D1 over NP plus C, where NP are the net proceeds, and the net proceeds are simply the price minus the flotation cost, which is 15% of 38 rand, we get 32.30 rand. Then we simply take our dividend D1 over 32.30 plus the growth rate. And then the cost of the preference shares is simply the dividend over the net proceeds our dividend is 9%, this 9% right here. Sorry. <clears throat> our, our dividend is simply the 9%, the 9% which we were told uh, is the 9% associated with the, the dividend payment of the preference share. Let me just put the screen back up. Okay. All right. Okay. So the 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 nine percent. Sorry, hold on. Yeah. So the nine percent is simply the 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 nine percent uh, that was stated here. Yeah, that's the dividend. So we multiply that nine percent by the par value to give us the dividend of the share. The net proceeds is simply the the par value, the issuing price, uh, minus 5% of the par value, which will give us 68.4. Remember, 5% of 72 is 0 0.05 times 72. Then we take our dividend divided by the, the net proceeds, and we get 9.47%. Uh, OK we get 9.47%. So those are the component costs. And then the next part of the question says, calculate the company's uh, weighted average cost of capital. Calculate the company's weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so the next part of the question uh, asks us to calculate the company's weighted average cost of capital. Now, uh, to get the weighted average cost of capital, we, we need to, to use what we call the residual theory of dividends. Now, this is a, it's a very important theory that you should make sure that you understand for the exam. The residual theory of dividends. Okay. So, um, and the, the residual theory of dividends will help us to determine uh, the the split. The residual theory of the, the residual theory of dividends will help us to determine the split uh, between um, weight uh, of existing ordinary shares, weight of existing ordinary shares, and uh, weight of new ordinary shares, okay? So I'll take you through that. Whenever you have a question on the residual theory of dividends and you're asked to calculate the WAC, you need to, to pay special attention. So the first thing we're going to do, we're told that the machine, uh, sorry, we're told that Autos on Tire Limited, uh, they want to invest in a 10 million rand new plant, right? And machinery. So, um what we have to do is we have to calculate the the amount of debt that is going to be in that uh, 10 million right the amount of debt that's going to be in that 10 million so we say 35 percent multiplied by that 10 million 
and we get 3.5 million, right? So it means there's going to be 3.5, this 10 million is going to consist of 3.5 million in debt. Remember the, the 35% is simply this percentage that we got for the amount of debt uh, found uh, in uh, the capital structure, the optimal capital structure. And then 55%, uh, the amount of equity in the 10 million, we simply say um, the 55% the in equity times 10 million. So it means equity uh, will consist of 5.5 million in the 10 million. And then lastly, preference shares, uh, the weight of preference shares is 10% times 10 million. So preference shares will consist of 1 million uh, in that 10 million. So this is the first part. And then the residual theory of dividends, what the residual theory of dividends says, it says that um, this 5.5 million that we need for equity, it will be taken from the net income or the retained earnings. It will be taken from the net income or the retained earnings. Remember, we were told that uh, the company is going to have net income of 1.8 million. So this 5.5 million, it will be raised from that net income. Right, so part of this 5.5 million will come from the net income. That's what the residual theory says. It says that all of our net income will go to equity finance uh, before we pay any dividends. So it means all of this 1.8 million is going to be eaten up um, and taken to finance equity, right? So even though we take this 1.8 million to finance equity, we are still going to be short 3.7 million because we need 5.5 million for equity. We'll get 1.8 from the retained earnings from the net income, but we actually need 5.5. So if we say 1.8 million minus 5.5, it means we'll still need uh, 3.7 million. It's just 1.8 million minus 5.5. We'll still need 3.7 million in equity. So we'll still have an equity need of 3.7 million. This is how much equity we'll still need. So this equity that we need, we'll obtain it from issuing new ordinary shares. The company will issue new ordinary shares. The company is going to issue new ordinary shares with 3.7 million. So the reason we did this is that we want to get the weight of the new ordinary shares and the weight of the existing ordinary shares using these two amounts, okay? So how are we going to do that? The weight of debt will still be 35%. Weight of preference shares will still be 10%. However, the weight of the existing ordinary shares, which is the weight of retained earnings will be 1.8 million which is coming from our net income divided by uh, the total uh, amount that we need uh, for the finance of the machine and the, the, the plant. So this will be 18%. So the, the retained earnings will make up 18% of our capital in our capital structure to finance this machine. And then the new ordinary shares will be 3.7 million divided by 10 million, which is 37%. So you'll find that even if we add this 18% plus this 37%, we will still get 55%, which is uh, similar to the total weight of equity in our target capital structure. And then we will then take uh, the weight of debt times the after-tax cost of debt. We don't have to multiply by one minus the tax rate again because we've already told us the after-tax cost of debt plus the weight of new ordinary shares times the cost of new ordinary shares that we calculated before plus the weight of existing ordinary shares times the cost of um, existing ordinary shares that we calculated before plus the weight in preference shares times the cost in preference shares. So we add all of this up and then we get 10.89%, which is our weighted average cost of capital. So make sure you understand the, the residual theory of dividends. This isn't the only type of example you can get on the residual theory of dividends. There are many different types. 
sometimes you can be asked to, to calculate the, the payout ratio or the retention ratio of dividends. Like the, the examples can be different. Sometimes you won't even have an equity need. Sometimes the, the net income will be able to meet all of the equity needs. So there won't be any need to issue new ordinary shares. So you need to practice a lot on the residual theory of dividends. It always comes up in assignments and in exams. Okay, lastly, let's look at question four. Uh, question four says ShopRite Holding Limited is the largest supermarket retailer uh, on the African continent uh, with more than 2,934 outlets. The company intends to raise 30 million to purchase a fleet of trucks to transport goods from various stores. So the company will finance a fleet of trucks as follows, uh, debt 30%, uh, the company will sell five year, 8% paid quarterly coupon bonds each year with a par value of 1,000 rand to be sold at a premium of 50 rand and flotation cost of 2.5%. Ordinary shares, the firm's ordinary shares are currently selling for 50 rand per share. The dividend is expected to be paid at the end of the coming year, 2021, at four rand. And in the past, the dividends have followed this pattern. From 2016 to 2020, these were the dividends. Uh, it is expected to attract buyers. New ordinary shares must be underpriced by 10% per share, and the firm must also pay uh, three rent per share in flotation costs. Uh, then um, we're also told that shop rights will finance the rest of the money by issuing 12% preference shares that are expected to sell for a par value of 75 rent per share. So the cost of issuing and selling the shares is expected to be 7%. And then we're told that human tax rate of 29%. Uh, calculate the company's component of cost of capital in other words, calculate the company's component cost of capital. This off, I think, shouldn't be the answer mistake. And then determine ShopRite holding limited weighted average cost of capital. So if we've covered this in the previous question, it shouldn't take us too much time. Cost of debt. Uh, remember, we have uh, quarterly coupon payments. So we need to multiply our number of years by four when we use our financial calculator. Uh, we need to divide our coupon payments by four. Uh, we take the coupon rate of 8% times the par value of 1,000. Then we divide by four because we have quarterly coupon payments. So uh, the answer is 20. 20 will be our PMT. Uh, five by four, 20 will also be our N. Our future value will be 1,000, which is the par value as given in the question. We're told the bond is a par value of 1,000. And then um, we then uh, calculate the PV, uh, the proceeds from issuing the bond. And the proceeds from issuing the bond are going to be the par value plus 50 rand. We add 50 rand because 50 rand is a premium. However, if the question had said 50 rand is a discount, we were going to subtract it. But because the question said it's a premium, we add it, okay? Then we subtract 2.5% uh, of 1,000. 2.5% of 1,000 uh, is going to be 25. And uh, the, these are the flotation and issuing costs. So we're going to have 1,000 plus 50. Uh, minus uh, 25, giving us 1,025 as our net proceeds. And remember, when we put those net proceeds to calculate uh, the cost of debt before tax, I over YR on our calculator, be sure to put the net proceeds as a negative. If you don't put them as a negative, uh, your question, your calculator might say no solution or it might say error, okay? So we then do that. Uh, we enter 20 as our N, uh, 20 as our PMT, this 20, five by four, which is 20 as our N, 1,000 as our future value, minus 1,025 as our PV. Uh, our calculator will give us 1.85 and then we multiply it by four because we are working with quarterly coupon payments. This 1.85%, this yield, this 1.85%, it's a quarterly yield, but we need to change it into 
and annual yield. So remember to multiply by four. So these are just fin uh, 2601 calculations that you should be familiar with from fin 2601. And then once we get the, 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 the cost of debt before tax, we take that cost of debt before tax and we multiply it by one minus the tax rate to give us 5.33%, uh, which is the after tax cost of debt. Okay, so that's important. So remember quarterly, uh, five by four, 8% times the par value divided by four. Um, and then remember the final yield, you multiply it by four. If it was semi-annual, we would deal with two, five by two, 8% divided by two times 1,000, then the final yield value will multiply by two. Monthly, five by 12, 8% divided by 12 uh, times 1,000 for the coupon payments. The final yield, we would multiply it by 12. Okay. Uh, then we again have to calculate the cost of existing equity and the cost of new equity. I'm not going to go through this again, uh, you should be familiar with this from the previous example we did. The only difference with this question is that you have to calculate the growth rate. You have to calculate the growth rate in dividends. We were not given the growth rate in dividends. And to get the growth rate in dividends, you simply take uh, 2.85 in 2016 as your present value. Again, you put this as a negative, 3.75. Uh, as your future value. You put four as the number of years. It's simply 2020 minus 2016, which is four years. And then you calculate the growth rate. And then you just use this formula to calculate the cost of existing equity D1 over P0 plus G, uh, giving us 15.10%. And then, um, to get the cost of uh, new equity. Remember I said every time you're given net pros, you're given flotation costs and discounts, you need to calculate the cost of existing equity and the cost of new equity, right? Because you see you were given flotation costs, uh, the share must be underpriced by 10%. With ordinary shares, you almost always have to calculate the cost of existing equity and also the cost of new equity. So we use that growth rate that we got. And then to get the net proceeds, we take the price uh, minus uh, the flotation costs of three rand. And then we're told the share must be underpriced by 10%. So uh, it should be trading at a discount of 10%. So we say the price minus 10% of the price minus three rand. If we were told it will be trading at a at a premium of 10%, we would add plus, we would say plus 10% of the price. But because we're told that uh, it should be trading uh, at an underpriced value of 10%, we subtract, we get 42. Then we simply take our dividend divided by the net proceeds plus the growth rate. Then we get the cost of equity, uh, the cost of new equity, Cost of preference shares, again, uh, we've just done an example like this in question three. So question four isn't too difficult. Simply take your percentage times the power value to get the dividend, uh, which is nine. And then our net proceeds are the power value uh, minus the flotation costs. We're told the cost of issuing are going to be 7% of the power value. So we simply say 75 minus 7% 7 of 75, uh, we get 69.75, nine over 69.75 gives us 12.9%. So those are the component costs. And then finally, uh, to get the weighted average cost of capital. Yeah, we are not using the residual theory of dividends, right? We're not using the residual theory of dividends. What we do, when we are not using the residual theory of dividends, you need to calculate uh, two weighted average costs of capital. You need to calculate the WAC above the breakpoint of equity. Our weighted average cost of capital above the breakpoint of equity uses the new cost of equity in the formula for WAC. 
whereas our work below the break points of equity, below you issue new shares, before you issue new shares, our work before you issue new shares, we simply use um, the, the cost of uh, existing ordinary shares. We simply use the cost of existing ordinary shares, which is 15.10%. Uh, so the weights will be the same, but we just use the cost of existing ordinary shares, right? And then we get 12.68%. Uh, these, these weights uh, are simply given in the question, then the optimal capital structure. Remember, they're simply the, the optimal capital structure, 30%, 55%, and 15%, um, right? And then we simply use those costs uh, that we calculated before. So we get the work above the breakpoint of equity and the work below the breakpoint of equity. Um, and then uh, we have our weighted average cost of capital, right? Okay. <clears throat> so that brings us to an end of the discussion class on assignment one. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope the, the classes have been helpful, both of them, the first one and this one, the second one. As usual, if you have any questions or queries with regards to any of the concepts covered in the class, please feel free to let me know. I won't always be able to get back to you promptly, but I'll try to do so as soon as I can. Uh, thank you very much for listening and all the best with your studies.